Hi, I am Patrick Palm, CEO and founder of Favro, and this is the Learn From Leaders podcast. The background to these interviews is that Favro clients are some of the most innovative and agile businesses out there. And it's used for collaborative planning by marketing teams, by product teams, HR, management teams. And what this means is that we get to know some truly inspiring people. So what we do in this podcast is that I invite them here for conversation about something where they are true leaders. So we can all learn from it. Let's go. So we are live with uh, Martina and uh, Yaruna. Uh, welcome to the podcast, uh, Learn from Leaders. Now, um, thank you so much for being here. You know, this is quite a special one because we have two guests today. Hi, everyone. Super Thanks exciting. for having us. Yeah, so um, let's make sure that we get your uh, background stories here. So, you know, maybe we can start with you, Martina. Um, I think it's safe to say that you're a bit of a rising star within tech. Um, you know, you are at Unity, uh, but you also are finding the energy to do like a lot of cool stuff uh, on the side. You know, maybe maybe you can tell a bit about about that. Yeah. So uh, thank you for having me. That is very <laughs> generous of you to say. Um, yeah. So I'm originally Swedish, uh, currently living in Copenhagen, and as you mentioned, working for Unity in my day to day. But outside of Unity, I am one of the people running a um, charity called Random Hacks of Kindness Copenhagen. So basically, we're a nonprofit trying to help NGOs to address and solve their uh, real life digital problems uh, by applying technical talent and figuring out how to um, how to lessen their pains uh, during a hackathon. So yeah, that is that is a bit about what we're doing. All right, awesome. And today is a bit of a special because you know we got um, Yarune in the um, in the podcast, and this is the first time on this podcast I actually have you know one of my employees. So you know you're you're a CMO at that Favro, but also uh, you are doing some things on the side. So why don't you jump into that? Yeah. So um, at my free time or after work time at Favro, um, I'm working in Women Go Tech initiative, and this is the very first mentorship program in Lithuania for women who want to jump from non-tech sector to the tech one, or they want to accelerate their career. So meaning being in some kind of junior position and actually growing in the career and taking a bigger role as such. And the initiative is already six years old, quite quite long. And if I'm not mistaken, you know, you have been very successful in also kind of fundraising and, you know, making sure that this is one of the most um, successful, um, uh, maybe I should call it NGOs, you know, in, uh, in Lithuania. So, you know, all very impressive. Now, let's jump into the topic of today, which is uh, boosting women in tech. And a lot of companies are talking a lot about, um, you know, getting more women into the companies, you know, inclusion, et cetera, et cetera, right? But I would like to get your personal perspectives on, you know, why is boosting women in tech actually important? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Martina. Yeah, so um, this is also another passion uh, topic of mine, having, um, you know, facilitated and had a lot of conversations about this with experts from all kinds of um, areas in the in the startup scene. But I think personally, why it's important to have inclusion as a really big like core of the business model is just to make sure that uh, you see someone that you can relate to. Um, so for me as a woman, of course, it helps to see other women in tech, for example, or that you're able to get other types of opinions and uh, insights from, and then we're coming more into inclusion, right? So it's not only about uh, women, but also all people from all walks of life um, and getting those input in that insight is super valuable to build strong and resilient businesses, in my opinion. Uh, cool. And uh, Yeruna, what's your personal perspective on this? I think one of the things, of course, is the creativity part that many of us would say, uh, because if you have the representation of women, so of course, you're building most probably the stronger, stronger technology, stronger vision that you have, whatever you are doing. And also, it's kind of the stopping sign for the future problems to raise because you are representing bigger group as such. Um, 
but uh, living in the country, Lithuania, it's quite small one. So I have this, uh, the complex of the small country in me. And uh, when we figure out that we want to do something related to women in technology, it was very much driven from that angle that, oh, shit, we have around 18% of women in the technology in Lithuania. And that is so, so bad because there are so a lot of a business that are coming here. For example, Fevero also came. One, one of the things was talents as such. And then we, are, we don't have this huge part of the population and how we can actually give for ourselves that kind of the opportunity. And then we looked at all the statistics and all of the things and understood that, okay, if women are going to maternity leave, uh, they're staying there around five years, then they're aging, uh, aging um, faster and so on. And then it's so, so many of the complex problems that you have at the very end, because it's just, they are not represented in the sector, which is giving the, most benefit in the economy as such. So um, I, mean, I think both of you um, mentioned representation in you know various ways. Um, maybe I can start with you, you know, Martina. Did you did you ever have any any role models? You know, someone that you know you felt okay, I want to follow this way, or did you feel like okay, this is like a totally uncharted territory you know i'm going to be the first woman walking into this I, I would love to hear a bit about that so i i was definitely not the first woman to walk into tech especially not in in stockholm um so to give a bit of background i was part of the, my first tech conference when i was 16 and that was not a lot of a female representation there but i think that um i could still see that people were driven by the same uh, objectives as, as I were and having the same kind of motivation. So I would, however, say that there has definitely been prominent people alongside my career so far, women in particular, that has definitely um, steered the way into into tech. One of them is my dad, but also my aunt. And I think having that close kind of tech background from a family standpoint is really important. But of course, I've also looked uh, outside but I can't name one in particular. I think I seek inspiration from a lot of places. Right now, I have a lot of friends as well that I'm looking up to. What about you, Yaruna? Uh, did you have um, some role models to follow? Yes, I did. I think that in general, I'm feeling very lucky that I had opportunity to work with um, many people who really pushed my career and pushed me as a personality. Uh, funny to say in this discussion, but they all were men, but they dedicated a lot of time actually in believing me and giving sometimes a bit of the trust and so on in the very early days and uh, that uh, maybe it was some kind of the push also for myself to believe more in some of the things, the career aspects and so on. So I'm actually having a lot of those people. So one of the things which is uh, discussed quite a bit right now um, in the you know tech and you know venture capital industry is the um, underrepresentation of women and in general um, diversity when it comes to raising venture capital and there's, there's like a lot of statistics and, and articles about this. But one of the things I find quite interesting is that when you look at they say the whole funnel. Um, also, the amount of women that are even trying to get venture capital is extremely low. Um, I, I would love to hear kind of like your perspectives on this. I mean, why why are because Martina, if you take you as an example, I mean, you're at Unity, and Unity is you know one of those companies where um, a lot of people that choose to leave Unity often do it, you know, to start a company, right? It's, it's like um, I think you know some call it like a hangar you know hangar ship yeah uh, i don't know yeah hangar ship you know it's like you know people are like coming in and they learn a lot of things but then when they leave like they start companies so it's it's very like important for the economy right um and um yeah i'm, I'm just curious about the perspective here on uh, you know wh why so few women are actually starting companies that are being part of you know founding teams yeah i think that's so interesting cuz 
I think it's also a perception that many um, fall into, which is that there just isn't any, uh, for example, female founders or um, founders of other that aren't male, basically. Um, but I think it's just about looking in the right places and providing the safe space. Uh, and I mean, we've I've had conversations about this before with experts and sourcing experts as well. And, and we spoke a lot about uh, that the use of language can be a very important piece. So is it more of a male kind of um, skewed type of language? Then you will definitely generate more applications from men. Um, but I think also there are, I mean, so many benefits of having female founded companies. I mean, I think it's somewhere around like almost 50% um, of female founded companies are generating more than 50% of um, revenue than the male counterparts. And I think that's just fascinating that I think it's just about looking in the right places and making sure that it is coming into like a safe environment uh, and allowing there's there's um, incubators in the US, for example, that is solely based on making sure that they provide mentorship um, for women that is maybe not in the usual working hours because maybe they have a family that men perhaps don't take as much into account. Uh, so it's about providing that network, uh, I would say. So if I can, you know, throw in a bit of a, you know, controversial question there, you know, so you use the term safe space. Um, I would love to hear a bit you know, more what that means. And the controversial part of it would be, What's like the difference between a safe space and simply being less demanding? You know, because you know, I, I I built a couple of companies and I fundraised several times, and it's like ridiculously challenging. I mean, venture capital is like crazy tough. I mean, I've been taking like you know fifty no's, hundred no's, you know, before you actually get that check. You know, uh, so it's 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 really really hard. So you know, what's the difference between like safe space and like just simply being less demanding? You know. Yeah, uh, I can speak about this for days. So uh, I would say that in the funnel that you also mentioned before, you have to be very careful as a as a VC to understand what you're imposing on the teams that you're talking to, right? So of course you're going to get hundreds of no's until you get that yes, but also what type of questions are you asking? So there was this um, really in interesting study at Stockholm School of Economics by Conley, I believe, that was about promotion versus prevention questions. And it's all about um, the VCs in a situation of, of sourcing companies, they're asking different types of questions depending on who is sitting in front of them. So for women, they got more, you know, preventative questions. They asked about how will you be secure in this and responsibility and security, those kind of very heavy uh, questions. Whereas their male counterparts, they were asking about ideals and, you know, hopes and dreams and achievements. And it showed that it led the conversation different ways. So um, I think that awareness of making sure that you do I, we keep coming back to the safe space, but I think it's also about being responsible for what you do as a VC and how you, yeah, demanding is maybe a good word, but you also have to be of higher standards yourself, I would say. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep asking the tough questions here. So, um, you know, from what you were saying, you know, it sounds like it's more about maybe equal space that. You know, you were describing that, you know, women are getting different questions than the men in a way that already skews the whole setup from the beginning. So it's, al it's almost like more about like, a, like let's say, a fair space. Um, For sure. Are, are we, so, um, you know, again, on the theme here of, of, you know, controversial questions, are we making potentially like disservice to this by calling it safe space instead of fair space? Is, is there, is there, um, is there a risk? that you know we're you know sugarcoating the problem so to say instead of just kind of calling a spade a spade do you, do you want to jump in <laughs> yeah you, you can you can continue i will add on okay uh i mean of course there is it's the same thing of of talking about women in tech versus talking about inclusion in tech so um are you calling out a problem that is 
easier to address if you say that it's a safe space versus an equal space. Of course, it should be an equal space. But some people um, and some kind of setups of people's lives might need some extra handholding. Uh, and I think today it's probably geared more towards men. Uh, if we're, you know, calling it super, you know, drawing everything over the same same line. But um, so, yes, equal is probably a better word, but we we're not equal. So then we need to provide a safe space in order to be equal eventually. You know what I mean? Um, I would agree and disagree. Um, I think that it, it's very interesting angle exactly on how we are sugarcoating quite a lot of the times and uh, not naming uh, the things how they really are. And uh, a lot of us now jumping companies, people doing their brands with equality, inclusion, and all of these uh, nice things to say that they really taking care of it. And it, it is kind of the game of the sugar coating a lot of the things. In this particular situation, mm, I would say that it's also we need to take into consideration that who are the VCs and VCs are most men. And uh, when they are most of the men, you have that inherited bias in all of the things that you're doing. So you are not necessarily even aware of uh, how you treated, what you did and so on. But this is such a long path as such to go that it's not necessarily a problem uh, that you can solve and see and so on. So it's, it's, it's a long journey as such, you know. So still what you need to do at first also to think about the representation in your VC, uh, what you have in order to evaluate also in, in the way that it would be seriously equally and so on. Yeah, and I think the hom like having homogeneous VCs is obviously a, a trap in itself. So if you want to build something that's not a homogeneous company, then of course you need the support of, of a more diverse um, VC as well. I think that's a good point. Do you, do you, do you find that, um, you know, have you seen that there's been some change, you know, when it comes to VCs? I've definitely seen some change, but I think one great example is um, SSE Business Lab. So they are putting a requirement. So that's the Stockholm based uh, accelerator. Um, they're putting requirements on both the teams and the VCs to be diverse. So uh, the startups coming in has a they have requirements of how diverse they need to be. And I think have, setting the setting the bar there for the VCs as well is very really where you can make a lot of difference um, in ensuring that the diversity comes through in all in all areas. Um, I, I, t yeah. I totally would agree that there is a change. And I think it's uh, especially now everyone is rethinking everything after the COVID situation as such. And um, we lacking well, at least in the Athena market, we are lacking the very good ideas, you know, that you hear it and you want to invest, that the strong pitches as such. And it not so much then matters who is behind the idea's agenda or something, but you are really looking for the business opportunities and, and how it is going with that, where to put the money safely. Uh, so this is one of the things. And in general, what we see that during the pandemics, women lost their jobs, like, a lot because they are mostly in the service sector and uh, it, it is the push for for women as such to think about it what to do so after post pandemics we see also the increase of women startups as such because they were kind of okay what i'm going to do now maybe i had the idea before but i never pursue it and so on so i think there is quite a lot of the positive things that are happening well i'm happy to hear that so Let's take it back to the um, to the you know the campus employers um, and I, you know again I'm going to ask you know um, a tough question. So when it comes to like the actions that companies are doing, you know that employers are doing, um, I would like to hear both of your perspectives on you know what do you think are like good actions that will make real change uh, versus actions that are really virtue signaling because. I think we can agree that there's quite a bit of virtue signaling going on in this kind of space. 
So from what I see now that um, as companies are really lacking the talents, what they're going for is a lot of, in general, just simple advertisement. How cool is to be here and women come join us. It's amazing. And you will receive a lot of the resources uh, you can learn and so on. Um, I see a lot of the academies that companies are building that we can give for you, like the very junior junior skill set that you will be capable to start your position and so on. So a lot of these kind of the initiatives, but they are coming from the angle that we just need actually the meat that would come and do the job. We just need that someone would do the job. And I think that it's not the change that it will be long lasting because what it will happen in the end, okay, someone will start to do the job, but then will understand that, okay, maybe I'm not fitting here and they in the end will drop. But what what there are possibilities on what companies can do is still the answers community. The problem is just too big to handle by your own initiative and what. So what I think like women go tech and similar initiatives, why they are very good because you need just to take down your hat that I need to hire now when 100 uh, developers, but you need somehow to do the clusters. You need to cooperate with each other and then think, okay, we together uh, our the the biggest rivals and so on. We need to prepare somehow the course, the mentoring that people would really decide that I want to exceed in this kind of path. And uh, only by this unity and community, you can actually capable to do the change. Uh, I don't see any other of the things if you will do like very small initiatives by yourself that it will make like really drastic change as such. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think building on top of, of what, so of course companies need to do something as a whole and go come together as an industry to make sure that you're not only providing the opportunities uh, to the right, in the right spaces, but also thinking about the, the there you need to also educate people about how to get into tech, right? So it's not only providing the right uh, positions, but it's also, can we, can we educate people? Can we set up training programs? Can we, can we make sure that we're creating long-lasting impact for uh, for STEM people or tech people in general? Or um, yeah. And then also something that I find quite interesting is that if, and that's also on the mentorship part, is that the more mentorship you have in an organization, the more equal opportunities you have. So regardless of who you are or what gender you are, what sexual orientation you have, the more mentors uh, available and the more equal access to opportunities that could be, you know, having more uh, equalized processes around hiring or uh, whatnot, that will definitely also help um, increase diversity. And, And I actually read a report the other day um, from Culture Amp, which is really good. And they pointed out that if you want to hire diverse talent, and you can also think about remote hiring. So, for example, if you're not from a socioeconomic background that maybe allows you to live in a, in a large um, metropolitan city in Europe or in the US, then allowing remote workers will also uh, increase the influx of people that of always, you know, of every type of socioeconomic background, no matter where you're, uh, where you're able to live financially. You know, that makes me think about um, a conversation I had recently with uh, with um, one of our customers at Favro, who, you know, they used to raise venture capital. You know, they had to recruit a lot of people, and um, yeah, you know, they kind of hybrid, but they, they they still like to have you know some offices. But what they did was that is that well. If we find like a place where we we um, notice that we hire a lot of people, then we're going to be like, okay, we, we we seem to have like a cluster here, so now we're going to set up a little hub there, like an office, um, which is very different from the traditional thinking of saying, okay, we're going to have an office here, and now we're going to recruit there. Um, I kind of I thought that was a pretty cool um, cool way of thinking about it. Um, For sure. we, we're getting a little bit towards the end. Um, I I am. Um, I would like to hear your view on w- where do you think this is going? I mean, if you're going to like drive, you know, draw a trend here, you know, uh, do you think we are moving towards a better place in a fast way? 
Do you think we're standing still? Do you think we're going backwards? I mean, what, what's the, um, you know, where is this pointing, you know, with, you know, kind of like a five-year perspective? Uh, on my side, I really believe that, yes, it's, we are going on the positive now, but just too slow. This is a thing because it's, it's very simple seeing the numbers because there is a ton of statistics uh, that we have that is just not enough of people working in ICT and I'm not even talking about the woman as such. It's just in general, like employees, whatever who they would be. It's just not enough. And then we're starting to fight and actually put the efforts not in the right basket, let's say like that, because we're just fighting for the talents, raising the salaries as crazy, and then giving, I don't know, bean bags in the offices and Coca-Colas and beers and having fun, but not actual job. So <laughs> this is where we quite a lot of going. Um, but um, I see the positivity in the things that still companies starting to realize these things. And what I am happy about, at least in, in my country, that men, they quite a lot understand their own role. And uh, we, for example, we have 50% of mentors, men, and they're such a powerful voice. When we are missing the role models, women who would be everywhere in the press, in the news, that girls would see and me as a young woman would see that everything is possible and so on. So men are also taking this kind of the stand and it's, I would say, really equally important that they are all models. And then when they're telling these stories that, you know, I just came in and said, I will raise you a salary because you are not asking me for three years in a row. It, it's kind of, it's kind of changing the things also. So, um, yeah, we, positive but too slow yeah i totally agree we do need to speed up things <laughs> but i think that's a common thing of a uh, theme of most inclusion themes um and topics so i yeah companies are definitely realizing it i think um other types of minorities are, are more than aware but the majorities such as homogeneous <laughs> white men if we're being uh you know super black and white, it's, I mean, it's all about doing your own part. Uh, of course, we need to also take collective responsibility, get more governmental support in terms of promoting these kinds of, uh, of initiatives. But I think one, um, uh, there's a quote that's really good, that it's basically that fish doesn't see water. And I, it refers a lot to structural, um, you know, biases and, um, and yeah, things like that. And I think that's also something that you need to understand your own um, benefits. Like, what is it that you're coming with? I'm, I'm trying to find a word, but I can't find it. But um, basically, what kind of environment did you grow up in? How did that prime you? Uh, and seeing how that has benefited you versus how it hasn't benefited others. So yeah, in each part of the process, if you're, for example, part of a hiring process, or your higher ring, then making sure that uh, diversity and inclusion is part of each step is super important. Uh, cool. Um, I think when it comes to, uh, let's say, um, you know, representation, I think we've done a little bit of an improvement simply having this podcast now, because simply speaking, if I look at all the guests that we've been having on, on our podcasts, well, most are men. Um, but there has been some really, really inspiring women too. And now we for sure have, you know, made that, you know, you know, slightly, slightly better. Um, if I can just add one thing, I also, you know, we talked about the investor side before. Um, I think, um, a lot of the VCs are trying to find women they can promote into like a partner position. Uh, but one of the things I came across quite recently that made me very happy was um, um, one new VC fund, which is being started, and, and I'm going to be you know, part of one of the investors in this fund. And one of the you know, people who actually starts the fund is, is, is a veteran person in the game industry, which is a woman. And, and I think that actually is going to make quite a big difference because you know, if you have a, a VC fund and you know, two of the general partners are are man but one of them is a, is a woman already there you know you have a very um 
um, you know, you, you, you change the dynamic, you know, quite a bit because, you know, we have this whole conversation about, you know, firm washing. Um, but when, when, you know, one of the general partners, you know, is a woman, uh, you know, it's one of the founders of this, it, it, it's a much more kind of clear, you know, statement because for sure, uh, both on the VC side and on the founder side in the tech industry, um, this, this, it, it, it's, it's a brutally, you know, skewed um demographic you know between men and women um so we're we're quite far from you know where i think we want to be so um i really thank you for uh, this conversation today and uh well Yerun, i guess i see you in the office tomorrow and you know martina you know always a great a great time talking with you and i'll see you soon see you soon thank you so much all right thank thanks you thanks everyone bye. Bye. bye i hope you enjoyed that interview i certainly did if you want to elevate yourself as a modern leader and help your teams become even more successful, then check out Favor Academy at favor.com. They will find podcasts, webinars, articles, all free of charge. Check it out.